Hello everyone and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be looking at a central figure of Romanticism, the poet William Wordsworth. I'm going to be analysing one of William Wordsworth's most popular loved poems composed upon Westminster Bridge. And you'll see from the title there that the title includes the date September the 3rd and it was originally published as 1803. That's from the original publication from 1807. That's actually a typographical printing error as it should be 1802. I won't go into, I don't have time to go into the various sort of political and personal reasons why that date matters, including the Peace of Amiens, for example, uh, which was a brief period of calm in the middle of the tumultuous <laughs> Uh, ongoing war with France, but the date should say 1802. And that matters because we'll see later a journal entry of Dorothy Wordsworth from 1802. Today I'm going to think about and analyse the paradoxical nature of Wordsworth's poem to show how the paradoxical fundamental thought of the poem is taken up, is reflected in the paradoxical imagery within the poem. I'm also going to analyse and close read a journal entry by Dorothy Wordsworth, so William Wordsworth's sister, who describes their crossing of Westminster Bridge. And we can compare the two depictions explicitly to see how they both use imagery to describe the paradoxical scene that they are presented with. So I want to show you the importance of Dorothy Wordsworth in William Wordsworth's creative process. But I'm going to begin with some contextual information about Romanticism broadly and very sweepingly, but particularly I want to give you some contextual information about Westminster Bridge itself and the symbolism of Westminster Bridge because I think it will help you understand the poem a bit more fully. Before I forget, if you like what I do here on my channel, then do subscribe. It means that you'll see my new weekly videos when they're uploaded and hit the thumbs up. It really does help me out in YouTube's algorithm. One of the key tenets of Romanticism was a profound reverence for nature. William Wordsworth's reverence for nature is evident from his very earliest poetical productions. In his poem, The Tables Turned, for example, which was one of his lyrical ballads, which were published in 1798, Wordsworth declares, let nature be your teacher, and sweet is the law which nature brings. William Wordsworth was a poet of the so-called Lake School. That's along with Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Robert Southey. Collectively, they were known as the Lake School. And they're called the Lake School because they lived primarily in the Lake District. And the Lake District is a gorgeous region of Cumbria in Britain, and it's now a, a national park. And as the name suggests, it comprises many lakes surrounded by many hills and mountains. Now, in part, because of Wordsworth's poetry, the Lake District is associated with the idea of the sublimity of nature. So this is the words worthy an idea of nature as a sublime prospect, inducing awe in those who experience it. And in turn, Wordsworth himself is associated with ideas of the sublimity of nature. This is from Wordsworth's poem, Home at Grasmere. And Grasmere is the name of one of the lakes where William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth would live in Dove Cottage. It was a perfect place, all that luxurious nature could desire, but tempting to the spirit. Who could look and not feel motions there? Here should be my home, this valley be my world. The idea in this extract is that luxurious nature moves the human spirit, that one looks at luxurious nature and feels motions. Essentially that one's spirit and feelings are inspired by nature. So the Lake School is an apt title to think about Wordsworth and to classify his writing and his poetry. This is a very quick sweeping introduction to Wordsworth 
and Wordsworth's poetry. But the point is to emphasise that Wordsworth's poetry was, and indeed still is, associated with nature and particularly sublime nature, the power of nature to induce or inspiring sublime thoughts. So I want you to keep this in mind, that is Wordsworth's association with and deep interest in sublime nature as I discuss Wordsworth's poem composed upon Westminster Bridge. For those who don't know and aren't familiar with London particularly, Westminster Bridge is a bridge in the very centre of London. It's right at the heart of political London and therefore political Britain because Westminster Bridge leads to the Houses of Parliament. It did at the turn of the 19th century when William Wordsworth was crossing Westminster Bridge as it still does today. And you can see on that map there from 1746 that when you cross Westminster Bridge going towards the left, that on the left hand side there is Parliament. Furthermore, the River Thames, which flows underneath Westminster Bridge, was the heart of London's trade. The river would have been bustling all day long with traders, merchants, goods, commerce, etc. Water was the principal means of transporting goods and it was very much quicker than going across land because you'd have to transport all your goods over land by horse and cart. So it was much quicker, much easier, much more efficient to go by water. And so the Thames was at the heart of London's business, its economic lifeline. And of course, that's why so many cities are built on rivers, because they needed that lifeline, that trading lifeline to sustain them economically. And this print dated from between 1720 to 1760 gives a sense of the mercantile process in action. This is the business card of one Philip Frouchard, coal merchant at the Golden Heart in All Hallows Lane, Thames Street in London. And you can see all the other boats in the background and they would be engaged in similar commercial activities. And so Wordsworth's imagery of Westminster Bridge within the poem then combines both London's and so more generally Britain's political heart and its business commercial trading heart. We can take this just from the symbolism of Westminster Bridge. And Wordsworth makes the centrality of the imagery of Westminster Bridge clear from the title of the poem. And you wouldn't know the location specifically from the poem itself. You only know the specific location from the poem's title. But of course, you read the title first before you actually read the poem at all. And so you read the poem through the lens of knowing that it's about Westminster Bridge. And you imagine the poem speaker, the narrative voice standing on Westminster Bridge. And you might even imagine yourself standing on Westminster Bridge if you've ever stood on it before. The original printer from Wordsworth's 1807 volume has highlighted the location too in the way that they have chosen to set this title. So you can see that the font size within the title is different and it's highlighting the location, Westminster Bridge. Before I read through William Wordsworth's poem, and I promise I am going to get to the text itself imminently, I want to read Dorothy Wordsworth's description of the morning in question. This is the journal entry of Dorothy Wordsworth from 1802. And Dorothy Wordsworth, as I've said, was William Wordsworth's sister, and we can think of her as a collaborator. Dorothy Wordsworth kept journals, kept records of the events of their lives, and William Wordsworth would then read them and use them later, obviously with Dorothy's permission. So Dorothy certainly was a part of William Wordsworth's creative and writing process, which I want to show you today. This is Dorothy's account of her and William Wordsworth leaving London on the day in question. We left London on Saturday morning at half past five or six, the 31st of July. I have forgot which. We mounted the Dover coach at Charing Cross. So this is on their way to France. It was a beautiful morning. The city, and the city is the financial heart of the city, St Paul's, 
And St Paul's Cathedral is the Anglican Cathedral of the Bishop of London, and it's of the Church of England. So it's the religious heart of London, and also, of course, of the whole country being the Church of England. This is St Paul's as viewed from the Thames, and you can see its iconic dome there that still stands today. So we have the city, St Paul's, with the river and a multitude of little boats, which symbolises the commercial activity that I've been talking about. They made a most beautiful sight as we crossed Westminster Bridge. The houses were not overhung by their cloud of smoke, and they were spread out endlessly. Yet the sun shone so brightly with such a pure light that there was even something like the purity of one of nature's own grand spectacles. We rode on cheerfully. This is Dorothy Wordsworth's description of the episode. So now let's read William Wordsworth's poetic rendering of the same moment. William Wordsworth's Composed Upon Westminster Bridge was first published in Poems in Two Volumes, published in 1807. This is a really important volume in terms of literary history and the development of literary aesthetics. Really, it's a revolutionary challenge to the prevailing literary taste of the time. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that Dorothy Wordsworth's journal account is from July 1802 and William Wordsworth's poem composed upon Westminster Bridge is dated September the 3rd. That's because the poem was or it's thought that that's because the poem was written when Dorothy and William had got back from France and he was reflecting on their journey out. But to get to the poem, earth has not anything to show more fair and the hyperbole of this opening line serves to highlight the extent of the surprise that the speaker feels at what is about to unfold. So earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Silent. Bare. Ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie, open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock or hill. Never saw I, never felt, a calm so deep. The river glideth, at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. Within the poem then, you might say at the heart of the poem, is a central paradox, that the scene before him, the scene of the centre of London, a man-made artificial entity, probably about as far away from the Lake District as you can imagine, symbolically rather than geographically, Britain isn't that big a country, um, that this man-made artificial scene can be beautiful, perhaps even more beautiful than valley, rock or hill, or indeed lake. The speaker is surprised that this man-made artificial scene can produce deep feelings within him a profound, sublime calm. So compare this with Home at Grasmere that I mentioned earlier. Twas a perfect place, all that luxurious nature could desire, but tempting to the spirit who could look and not feel motions there. So instead, Wordsworth is feeling motions here in the heart of London, not there in the Lake District, but here in the heart of London and all that London represents, which is essentially man-made activity. Cleanth Brooks, who is an important literary critic and thinker of the 20th century in The Well-Wrought Urn, which is a seminal text of new criticism, which takes a a formalist approach to analysing texts, uh, particularly poetry, uh, was first published in the mid 20th century in 1947. 
Brooks describes the paradoxical situation within William Wordsworth's composed upon Westminster Bridge like this. The sonnet as a whole contains some very flat writing and some well-worn comparisons. The reader may ask, where then does the poem get its power? It gets it, it seems to me, from the paradoxical situation out of which the poem arises. The speaker is honestly surprised and he manages to get some sense of awed and the use of the word awe here connects ideas of the sublime. So the speaker manages to get some sense of awed surprise into the poem. It is odd to the poet that the city should be able to wear the beauty of the morning at all. Mount Snowdon, Skiddaw, Mont Blanc, these wear it by a natural right. They're all mountains, um, but surely not grimy, feverish London. The smokeless air reveals a city which the poet did not know existed. Man-made London is a part of nature too, is lighted by the sun of nature and lighted to as beautiful effect. I don't disagree with Brooks here. The paradoxical situation is that Wordsworth, the reverential lover of nature who feels beauty in and extols the beauty of the sublimity of nature on this morning finds London, centre of man-made artificial human existence, to be as beautiful as nature. But the paradoxical situation is not felt exclusively by William Wordsworth. Dorothy Wordsworth articulates this same paradox too in her journal entry. So if we return to Dorothy Wordsworth's journal, we see that she too experiences it as a beautiful morning. She too sees the man-made elements of the city with the hustle and bustle of city life. The city, which as I've said is symbolic of financial concerns, the Bank of England building for example is in the city of London. So when people talk about the city of London they're not talking about the whole city, <laughs> they're talking about a specific region of London which is called the city within the whole conglomeration of areas that makes up London and the city is particularly the financial district. So St Paul's as well as I've already said that's symbolic of religious concerns with the river and multitude of little boats so business and trade concerns. Those man-made aspects made a most beautiful sight as we crossed Westminster Bridge. The cloud of smoke that she refers to also symbolises human activity and industry. Dorothy had written in her journal the houses were not overhung by their cloud of smoke, suggesting, of course, that usually they do have a cloud of smoke, their cloud of smoke. It kind of belongs to them. So Dorothy's description is of the early morning before the working day, because every house and every factory would have fires raging during the day. And as you can imagine, over the course of the day, London would become foggy with smoke. I just wanted to show you these pictures because I think they're evocative and demonstrate how aware you would be in the early 19th century because of the smoke of the mechanised industry going on in a big city. Or in the contemporaneous words of William Blake who is a fellow romanticist and this is from his 1804 publication the preface to Milton which you may know as the hymn Jerusalem the words to the hymn Jerusalem in English cities according to Blake you were among these dark satanic mills I bring this up to show that in London the sun mentioned in both Dorothy Wordsworth's journal and William Wordsworth's poem would typically be obscured by smoke by industrial smoke as well as domestic smoke for much of the working day. Returning again to Dorothy's account then, the houses were not overhung by their cloud of smoke and they were spread out endlessly. Yet the sun shone so brightly with such a pure light. And again, there's a sense of the sublime in the image of the sun shining with heavenly purity that there was even something like the purity of one of nature's own grand spectacles. And I want to focus on the importance of the word yet. The word yet is often used to usher in a paradox. So we might say, for example, I hate him and yet I love him. 
In Dorothy's image here, the houses spread out endlessly so that there's imagery of human life and activity stretching out before the eyes endlessly, without end, without stopping. And yet, despite the evidence of and the symbolism of human man-made activity, there is a purity, a grandeur in nature's touch through the sunbeams, covering man-made artificial life and thus almost purifying it. The paradox that Cleanth Brooks discusses is present in Dorothy Wordsworth's imagery as well as in the imagery within William Wordsworth's poem. So I want to consider some of the similarities between William Wordsworth's poem and Dorothy Wordsworth's journal. Both describe the beauty of the morning scene. So Dorothy says it was a beautiful morning. William says beauty of the morning and then later beautifully. Both describe the man-made structures that can be seen. As I've said, Dorothy says the city, St Paul's with the river and the multitude of little boats made a most beautiful sight as we cross Westminster Bridge. And William Wordsworth writes, this city ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples. I do here want to point out a difference between the two. William extends Dorothy's imagery. So William Wordsworth's list is more extensive and pointed to cover more aspects of urban human life, of man-made civilization. Ships, as I've been talking about, symbolic of trade and business. Towers, and we can think here of the Houses of Parliament. You can see behind the text here in the picture. The word towers also brings to mind the Tower of London, which also sits along the Thames, symbolic of politics. The domes, especially as we learn from Dorothy's journal, the dome of St Paul's Cathedral, as I've said, symbolic of religion. Theatres, obviously where, where plays are performed, symbolic of the arts, and temples. The temple is the legal district of London. So the inner temple and the middle temple, for example, are two inns of court. So the temples are symbolic of the law. And you'll notice that these are all plurals here, ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples suggesting a kind of multitude, endless multitude here. So in Wordsworth's, William Wordsworth's one simple seeming line then in this list, ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples, he refers symbolically to five fundamental aspects of human civilization: business, politics, religion, art and law. Both texts hone in on the detail of smokelessness. Dorothy says the houses were not overhung by the cloud of smoke. William says smokeless air. Both particularly use the imagery of the bright sun. So Dorothy says the sun shone so brightly with such a pure light. William refers to the bright sun in his first splendour. And both importantly, because this is the kind of fundamental paradox of the imagery, they both compare the city with nature. Dorothy says that London is exhibiting the purity of one of nature's own grand spectacles. And William opens the poem by referring to earth. So we might imagine that this is going to be a poem about earth in a more conventional sense, about valleys and rocks and hills and so on. And he talks about the majesty of this site of earth. A really important similarity to note here is the way that William talks about the sight and Dorothy talks about the spectacle. So both require a spectator to see nature. And this is important because the notion of a spectator experiencing nature is fundamental to William Wordsworth's conception of good poetry. He rarely simply describes nature. Almost invariably, the conceit of his poetry is to have a person experiencing nature and reflect on how that experience has made them feel and what it makes them think. And this is one of the ways that Wordsworth fundamentally develops ideas about poetry. So in the 18th century, you have many what are called descriptive poems, which just describe nature. And not many of them are very, very beautiful and they describe nature very, very beautifully. But the poetry is about the description of nature. Wordsworth almost always filters 
the seeing of nature through an individual. And it, the poem is about the individual experiencing the sublimity of nature rather than a description of the sublimity of nature itself. So there's usually that human filter and it's about the human and what they think and what they feel. And this would go on later to be called the egotistical or Wordsworthian sublime. So that's what John Keats, who's another romantic poet, talks about when he talks about the Wordsworthian or egotistical sublime. And the criticism of Wordsworth is that actually his poetry isn't really about nature. It's about the egotism of the individual experiencing that nature, that he doesn't describe nature. Instead, he describes his own mind, usually the narrative voice we take to be Wordsworth's own mind often. That, that that is the point of the poem, to describe his own feelings rather than about nature itself, that it's egotistical. But that was a bit of an aside, but hopefully you can see how that filters in, even in this small use of sight here within this poem and having to have this human experiencing the spectacle of nature in Dorothy Wordsworth's words. Perhaps where the two differ most, so where Dorothy and William differ most, is in the description of the effect of the scene on that spectator. So Dorothy writes, we rode on cheerfully, and this is a perfectly adequate recording in a diary entry. You know, a journal is a very different thing from a poem. But William writes, never saw I, never felt a calm so deep. So the poem composed upon Westminster Bridge is about how the scene made the narrative voice feel. I felt. That really is the Wordsworthian or egotistical sublime that almost all of Wordsworth poetry boils down to this fundamental aspect, which is the way that the speaker felt or thinks about whatever it is that they're experiencing. In other words, this really isn't about Westminster Bridge, this isn't about London, this isn't about nature, this is only about the thoughts and feelings of the speaker. Conversely, there is no reflection in Dorothy's journal on how the scene made her feel. And that's not a criticism of Dorothy, as she wasn't trying to record that particularly in her journal. The reflection of the individual within the poem is the essential point often, as I've been saying, in William Wordsworth's poetry. So William Wordsworth is often thought of as a solitary genius, but I hope I've shown today how important Dorothy Wordsworth was in William Wordsworth's creative process. Dorothy's journals were records that she kept from the days that her and William spent together and so are an invaluable resource when analysing William Wordsworth's poetry. If you want to examine Dorothy's collaborative engagement with William elsewhere, then another great example is Dorothy's entry about daffodils, which was also written in 1802. And comparing that to William's very very famous poem Daffodils, which begins I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, which was also published in the 1807 volume. It's hard to know exactly how Dorothy Wordsworth's journals were used. We know that the journals were thought of as open documents within the family, so that they're not Dorothy's private secret thoughts and feelings. They're more family records of days past and experiences had together. And we know that Dorothy wrote them in part in order for William to read them later and reflect on later and use in his poetry later. We also don't know how much the two of them had spoken about each of these events before Dorothy wrote them down or if they had at all. On the day that the two of them crossed Westminster Bridge, for example, did they discuss how brightly the sun shone, the smokelessness of the air and the brilliant majesty of the scene? Or did Dorothy record her entry solo and then William pilfered it later uh, with Dorothy's blessing? We don't know, but I think it's fascinating to think about because, well, particularly because it disrupts our idea of artistic genius emanating from one lone individual, which is a hangover from the Romantic period. 
and in part set up by Wordsworth himself, as I've been talking about, about the egotistical sublime. The idea that artistic genius comes from the self-expression of one individual artistic genius. And looking at Dorothy Wordsworth's journals in tandem with William Wordsworth's poetry exposes that idea really as a sham, as a complete fabrication. And the key point that I want to emphasise is that Dorothy is a central collaborator in and contributor to William Wordsworth's creative process. William Wordsworth would not have created the poetry that he did without his sister Dorothy in a very practical way. And this is counter, as I've said, to our culturally inherited understanding of Wordsworth as a solitary figure, even though the idea of solitariness is encouraged by William Wordsworth himself within his own poetry. And we can see an example of that here in these two texts. So Dorothy says, we rode on cheerfully. Dorothy emphasises the collective. William, on the other hand, says, never saw I, never felt, a calm so deep. So William uses I, he uses the singular, he focuses on the solitary individual. And if you just read William Wordsworth's poem, then you would have no idea that there was anyone else with him at all when he was on Westminster Bridge. I want to close by looking at William Wordsworth's paradoxical imagery and metaphor within the poem. William Wordsworth extends the paradoxical imagery beyond Dorothy's journal entry and develops Cleanup Brooks's point in The Well-Wrought Urn that the poem details a paradoxical situation. And again, this is not a criticism of Dorothy's capabilities as a writer. She also presents the paradoxical situation described by Brooks, but she clearly wasn't attempting to create poetical images and metaphors in her writing. And she wasn't attempting to convey that paradox through form as William Wordsworth was, which I want to look at now. I want to consider this central image which comes in the centre of the octet. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning silent bare. So just to run very quickly through the form of the poem then, composed upon Westminster Bridge is a Petrarchan sonnet, so it's a poem of 14 lines long, it's composed first of an octet, so eight lines, then there's a volta, or a turn, and it closes with a sestet of six lines. Usually, as here in this sonnet, the octet describes something, and then the sestet reflects on what was described in the octet. And Wordsworth uses the rhyme scheme here, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D. A very straightforward rhyme. I'm not really talking about the sonnet form today except to say that the paradoxical image I want to discuss comes at the centre of the octet and even bridges the octet's two halves, so it forms a couplet of the A rhyme. I want quickly to look at the symbolism of the imagery of doth like a garment wear. In William Wordsworth's poetical image, man-made artificial life is represented as a garment. A garment is created, it's artificial, it's dress. We might think of Alexander Pope, for example, and his lines from Essay on Criticism, true wit is nature to advantage dressed, or expression is the dress of thought. The idea of dressing nature leaves an impression of ornament or embellishment or adornment. And we still use this imagery when we talk of dressing a salad. So you take nature, you take raw nature, and then you dress it with a man-made artificial substance in order to embellish it, to make it more appealing. The city is only wearing the beauty of the morning. It doesn't embody beauty itself. So just as you can put a garment on, you can take a garment off. It's not innate. And Dorothy had in fact originally written about made dressing, clothing, covering imagery in her journal entry too. This is as an extension of her image of one of nature's own grand spectacles. So Dorothy had originally written as well, made by herself and for herself, thrown over that huge city. This is talking about nature, made by herself, made by nature, but Dorothy had scrubbed through it with a double crossing. The word 
made suggests something artificial, something constructed, which seems at odds with nature, and one might even say paradoxical. And perhaps this is why it was crossed out. But it's interesting then that a similar idea remains in William Wordsworth's poem. And can you see what the central paradoxical metaphor within William Wordsworth's poem is? The central paradox is highlighted through the rhyme, wear and bear. Something cannot both be wearing a garment and be bare. It cannot both be dressed and naked, in other words. And the rhyme highlights this paradox. It highlights the oxymoronical imagery because you have wear and bear rhyming with each other. And actually, much later in 1836, when William Wordsworth was revising his poems for an upcoming publication, he responded to a friend's objection to this perceived paradox that a thing cannot both be clothed and bare and considered revising the lines as follows. Tell me if you approve of the following alteration, which is the best I can do for the amendment of the fault. The city now doth on her forehead wear the glorious crown of mourning, silent, bare. Ultimately, however, despite toying with the idea of amending the fault, of the paradox, and I think it's interesting and significant that Wordsworth chooses to use the word fault there, that he sees it as a fault within the poem. But still, despite having this fault, Wordsworth kept it as it was. He kept the paradox. So evidently he reflected that it wasn't quite such a fault in the poem after all. Perhaps it isn't such a fault because it isn't actually an insurmountable paradox. London wears a cloak of nature and of beauty because it is bare, it is stripped of the trappings, the garb of industry. So in other words, because London is not currently wearing the dressings of human industry, it is bare of its usual costume and so now can wear a garment of beauty. The word now, very important word there, it highlights the temporality. It highlights the temporary nature of this beautiful garment wearing. Because as soon as the city wakes up for the day, it will disrobe from the beauty of the morning and put on the apparel of industry. Thank you so much for listening. Do subscribe to my channel so that you can see my new videos when they're uploaded and comment below. I really love reading your responses.